Okay, so I just wanted to mention a couple things. People have been asking me about uh, sending problems and stuff. There's a lot of stuff on the ACORN site. There's a couple of old midterms. There's some old quizzes. There's solutions to those old midterms. Uh, those midterms were when I just taught the course. Remember the assignments now you've been getting with Dr. Ja. Uh, there's some synthesis problems. There'll be some things like that. Uh, and then I've talked about this numerous times. Uh, the textbook, the OpenStax textbooks, one of the things you'll see is that if you, this is instructor resources, here we have students resources. There's a student solution manual that's free. This stuff's all free. And the other thing I want to point out is in terms of the textbook, uh, oops, not that one. Where was I? Ah, here we go. Uh, so this is just the chapter on aldehydes and ketones. Is it? Yes. So nucleophilic addition of an amine. Look, it has all the mechanisms in there. Uh, this is a tremendous resource. And when you're as I've been telling you, the best thing to do, uh, it's late now, but I have told you this, the best thing is to take a look at the textbook before we cover the material. You know when it's coming up because the slides are out there, you know, the chapters, uh, you can find all that stuff. Uh, take a look at it beforehand, then when I do the lecture, you'll have an idea what's coming up, you'll have an idea where you're gonna have problems with, and you're going to learn that stuff much better uh, so I have the quizzes, I'll go get them, I forgot them. Uh, and I would have expected a little bit better on the quiz, but I do think one of the things that happens is you guys have not kicked it into gear yet. I have full confidence because every year that you guys can do this stuff, every year students are able to do this stuff. And you guys will be too, but you do have to put the effort in. Uh, today, I just wanted to go over a couple of things. I'm gonna do our kind of uh, chemistry of the carbonyl as it pertains to aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acid derivatives. That's a lot of it. There's also alcohols, but that's, uh, and you have to remember a few things from 2533. Mostly, you only did a few reactions in 2533, so eliminations with alcohols and alkyl bromides, how to convert alcohols to alkyl bromides, and then you have access to all sorts of things. Uh, I found two times for tutorials this weekend, Saturday at from two to four and Sunday at two to four. I, I'll, I was thinking Sunday two to four might be best. That will give you guys time to study. Uh, if there's some people who really, really need a tutorial on Saturday, I'll do it, but get together. There needs to be more than one of you. Uh, I'll do a tutorial Saturday too. The tutorials really aren't that helpful if you have not studied yet. Okay, so you need to study, and if possible, send me some questions I'm having trouble with, uh, because I don't know what you're having trouble with. You don't even know what you're having trouble with until you study and do it. Once you do that, we can have a nice long tutorial on, on Sunday, get out all those problems, okay? So let's just do a quick uh, <coughs> review of the chemistry of the carbonyl compound. So we know the carbonyl compound has this double bond. What we have been seeing time and time again, I'm just gonna do this. I'm gonna put R, and over here, I'm gonna put uh, X. So, if X equals H, it's an aldehyde. If X equals, uh, another R group, and by an R group we mean CH3, CH something, but just a carbon, just uh, maybe even a phenyl group, but then it's a ketone, okay? And if X equals CL, or if X equals another acid, this is an acid, carboxylic acid chloride, This is an acid anhydride. Okay, uh, if X equals OR, it's an aster. And if X equals N, I'm gonna send NHR, but of course it could be NH2, it could be NR2, or NHR, I just have NHR. 
and this is an amide. Okay. Carboxylic acid chloride, carboxylic acid anhydride, aldehyde, ketone. Uh, we could call this an ester or carboxylic acid ester. Same with this. This is a carboxylic acid amide or just an amide. Uh, we don't worry too much about naming them. You should be able to identify these, okay? That was really not done well in the quiz. We talked a month about four of those things, just four things, right? And you should be able to recognize them and name them. Uh, most of you think that this, apparently, this was the most popular answer. What is this? People told me it's a diester. It's not an ester. It's an acid anhydride, right? It has two carbonyl groups. An ester only has one carbonyl group, and then if I turn this into a CH2 group, <coughs> that's an ester, but we have to get rid of the oxygen, okay? So uh, this is my, uh, where, where I'm, some of you who have done less well, I realize you probably haven't put the work in yet, uh, but you have to put the work in. But we talked a month about this stuff. You should at least know how to name it. And so that tells me that you're not looking at the textbook. You're not preparing before the class. You're hoping to come to class and remember everything I say. That's not a good strategy. And don't worry, I mean, I really uh, like you guys. I think you're all smart. And I think that you're this is one of the this is when university gets a little bit tougher by second year we expect you guys to start working on your own a little bit more all this stuff is out there you don't even need me you can learn it all from a textbook one textbook you can learn all this material okay the lectures enhance that the lectures give you an opportunity to ask about the things that you have difficulty understanding from the textbook uh, so if you're not using the textbook and you're not getting the grade you want, your strategy is not good. If you're using the textbook and you're not getting a, a decent enough grade, come and talk to me. Uh, come and talk to me anyway, please come and talk to me. Uh, but I want to help you and you have to help yourself by opening that textbook. Okay. So we have these strings. I put them in a certain order. Hopefully you recognize that's the order of reactivity. These are the most reactive. And the least reactive down here. And that is, I'm going to put in a box here, towards All of these react by nucleophilic addition. And the reaction's the same for all of these. We've talked about, we kept doing the same thing. A lot of organic chemistry is about pattern recognition. And one of the things you wanna notice is that nucleophiles, when there's a, you should be able to identify what a nucleophile is now. We, you did that in 2533. Nucleophiles attack electrophiles. These are our electrophiles. the electrophilic position okay so students are telling me I don't know what to do put your pen on the paper find out where the pair of electrons is that's going to attack something nucleophiles attack electrophiles acids attack protons and pull them off I'm sorry bases attack protons and pull them off of acids I'm gonna talk in a second about we really only do kind of two different types of reactions in this course okay so let's Let's erase this and let's think about the two types of reactions we do in this course over and over and over again. And we want to start recognizing these patterns. I talk a lot about the curly arrows. There's a few of you having trouble with curly arrows. Straighten that out and this becomes a lot easier. leave this up here okay you can leave that for now
But right now, the two types of reactions we do in this course are Bronsted acid base, better known as proton transfer. These are one and the same reaction, okay? And every one of them involves a base that has a pair of electrons. And an acid, which has a proton that can be removed. All acid and base, Bronsted acid base, it is the same. It's a pair of electrons just pulling a proton off of something. Uh, our curly arrows show us that those electrons are reorganizing. They're on the base. They're probably uh, a lone pair, but they might not be. But most of the time, they're a lone pair. They pull off a proton here, and that goes onto there. We have formed a bond. And in this instance, because this was neutral, pulls off the proton, just the protons, our conjugate acid is, is positively charged, and our conjugate base has a negative charge, and now notice it has a pair of electrons. The product of every acid-base reaction is a conjugate acid and base, and they're on in equilibrium. That equilibrium depends on how good an acid this is and how good a base this is. So you should be able to recognize acid strength. We've talked about it. We've talked about it in 2533. We talked about it in 1013 and 1023, right? Now we talk about it a lot. So I'm, I'm telling you, if you don't understand what makes things acidic and basic, you need to brush up on that. We do mention it every once in a while. Electron withdrawing groups will suck electron density away from the place that has the proton and make it a stronger acid, okay? Uh, that's one of the things we remember. So this is one reaction, proton transfer reactions. We see those all the time. The other type of reaction we see is nucleophile electrophile reactions. I'm lying a little bit when I say these are the only two types of reactions. There's free radical reactions, which are a separate group, uh, and then there's pericyclic reactions, which we'll see. But for the most part, in this course, most of our reactions are gonna be a nucleophile, electrophile reaction, or kind of the backwards. Uh, and, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. But we see addition, elimination, okay? Those are the two subunits of this, addition and elimination. There's, there's a few other things, but this is the majority of the reactions you're gonna see. So let's now uh, zoom in a little bit. And I think one of the things that confuses a lot of people, I go through a big long mechanism and you, you zoom out and you look at it and you go, oh my God, that's a lot. You have to zoom in into each of these elementary reactions. And the only thing you have to think about is, is this an acid base? or is this a nucleophile electrophile? Where do I start my curly arrows and where do they point to? Okay, that's it. It's that, uh, I, I don't wanna say it's that easy, but, but that is it. And I think when you zoom out and you look at this great big mechanism, you get terrified and you think, oh my God, I have to memorize all that. But if you zoom in, you don't have to memorize things. All you have to do is figure out what's going on with these two different types of reactions, okay? So let's, zoom in a little bit, and I'm gonna zoom in generically at first, then I'll get specific. Every one of our reactions involves a nucleophile. I'm gonna make my nucleophile like this. There could be other things that's happening, but our nucleophile, uh, if we have a neutral nucleophile and a neutral electrophile, we always zoom in like this, okay? So this is just a nucleophile using its electrons to attack the electrophilic carbon. And the other arrow is just telling us where the electrons go. We form a 
this instance, in this instance, there's a positive charge there and a negative charge up top, okay? Everything's still neutral. Overall, everything's neutral, but we have a negative charge and a positive charge on our tetrahedral intermediate. charged nucleophile that wouldn't have a positive charge down there so the next thing what happens to this nucleophilic intermediate is all we have to figure out now so for all of those we listed we now just have to figure out what happens to the nucleophilic intermediate the top two the acid chloride and the acid anhydride and the bottom two uh, the uh, ester and the amide that X can leave Okay, and it can leave. Now, something will come along, will float along and pull off this proton. So I'm just gonna pull it off. And when I pull it off, it becomes neutral again, okay? If we had have used a negative one, we would have gotten right to that. So when we do things under with, where we have protons, there's a lot of protons transfer reactions. If you feel like you need to get rid of a proton, do something to get rid of that proton. Just look and see if you had a base around. As it turns out, this thing can be a base to it to pull the proton off if it has to. Lots of things can. But now, our tetrahedral intermediate <coughs> can do an elimination. And when it does that, done a substitution okay now if instead of pushing my arrows there I had to push my arrows here it just goes backwards that's also an elimination so an elimination is the opposite of a nucleophilic addition this was a nucleophilic addition this is an elimination of uh, that X thing okay so the acid chloride, X is, is a chloride, a very, very weak base. That's why it's so reactive. Uh, the anhydride, that X is a carboxylate anion, which is the conjugate base of a, of a carboxylic acid. It's a pretty weak base. If it was the ester, we would eliminate an alkoxide pretty strong base, stronger than sodium hydroxide, pretty strong. And if we eliminated the nitrogen uh, compound, the amide, we would have eliminated, we also confusingly call that negatively charged, when we pull a proton off of an amine, that's also called an amide. That's a little confusing, I admit. I didn't invent it, it is. But that amide anion, so this is also called an amide, had we had an ester and we had It would be RNH, RNH minus. This is an extremely strong base. So when we get rid of a weak base, those things are very reactive. If we have to get rid of a strong base, those things are very unreactive. Now also, the chloride, uh, the oxygen on the carboxylate, those are very electron withdrawing. That makes this more electrophilic as well, makes this reaction faster. And the fact that those are weak makes this reaction faster, more likely to go, more thermodynamically favorable, okay? So when we have an electron withdrawing group, it makes this more reactive, and when that electron withdrawing group is very a weak base when it comes off, it makes this go fast, okay? Aldehydes and ketones, their tetra intermediate, tetrahedral intermediate has to do something else because it cannot eliminate anything except the nucleophile maybe, that's reversible, but it's not gonna eliminate H minus. That's a super strong base. It's not gonna eliminate R minus, also a super strong base. So even though they're reactive towards the nucleophilic addition, they don't undergo that part. Those two things, the aldehydes and the ketones, 
don't undergo this elimination. They have to do something else. But all of the carboxylic acids just do this, the carboxylic acid derivatives. Okay, so we kind of covered all of that chemistry right there. Now let's take a look at the aldehydes and ketones and what happens to the tetrahedral intermediate. And I'm gonna use some specific uh, compounds, uh, okay? So let's take a look at uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just do something simple, and I'm going to use now in this particular instance, we do this under acid catalyzed conditions because we want to activate the carbonyl compound. Okay, so our first step in our reaction. Now this is a little bit tricky. H plus. If you're a pretty good chemist. H plus is gonna just sit on this, it's gonna react on this. And in fact, as soon as we throw H plus in, it's sitting on that, that's now our acid. The, that would exist. That's our acid. Doesn't matter what we threw in there, that's now our acid. If we threw HCl in there, it's gonna protonate this thing immediately. That thing's a decent acid, that's gonna, and most of the time it's just gonna react with this. These things are going to go back and forth. We do these under acid and all that stuff. But every once in a while, that thing's going to get protonated. Okay? This is a decent nucleophile. It has a pair of electrons. We can do this reaction without the acid, but I'm going to do it acid catalyzed. And all that happens here, once we protonate that, It's now very much more, that thing is much more reactive than this. And now our RNH2 is going to be the nucleophile. Proton transfer, nucleophile electrophile. I'm just going to put an R prime here now so we can distinguish them later on. Sorry, I should have done that at the start. Okay, so this is just a nucleophilic addition. This was proton transfer. This is nucleophilic addition. What do you think the next step in our reaction is going to be? So we can get rid of that. Uh, that just goes backwards, but that doesn't get us forwards. We want to move forward, okay? So, uh, what's this going to do? Well, something's going to come along and pull this proton off. So let's just do it. Uh, we have a... I wish I had a bigger board. Well, that's okay. I'm videoing it. So, let's... Something is going to come along and pull this off. Some base. We have lots of candidates for our base. We have lots of this around, we have this around. I don't know what our solvent is, our solvent may even act as a base, but something just comes along. <coughs> and pulls that proton. <coughs> Oops, sorry. I'm going to erase everything else. Pulls that proton off. That obviously can go back. I can just pull that proton off. So I'm going to take that thing over to here and start getting rid of this stuff. You don't, if you have room on your paper to the right of that thing I just made, you don't need to do this. I'm just moving it over here. We have this R C O H C H three. And we now have NH 
are from. Okay? Uh, what else do we have? Uh, oh, we still have our proton around. I'm going to put it as that H plus. It really should be that base connected to it, uh, but it's, it's sitting on something that's a base. That H plus is still around. So let's put our H plus over here somewhere. I'm going to put it up here. I'm just moving it. It's in solution. It can float around. It can go wherever it wants. So I've just moved my H plus up to there. Uh, now I'm going to get rid of this and go forward. I can always go back. Whatever, put that proton there. You can come along and take it off. That's okay. So we got here. It can go back. If something, uh, if that proton pops back on here, we just go backwards. Okay, but that's, we don't want to go backwards. Where else can that proton go? Okay, we don't want to put it on the nitrogen. How many people think I'm going to put it on the carbon? No, see, you guys know this. You know the next reaction. You're going to put this proton on the oxygen, aren't you? Now, I helped you out by drawing it over there, but you now know this. This just, that's a proton transfer reaction. We had a bunch of proton transfer reactions. Whenever a proton jumps on, it can jump off. But now, hopefully, in this particular instance, okay, we protonated that oxygen. We like that because we like water. Water can now get pushed off of here. Uh, we can just lose water. This is just an elimination. It's just an elimination of a crappy nucleophile. Now I'm going to do something a little different. There's a lone pair of electrons here. I'm just going to do this, okay? Um, when I do that, That's my lone pair of electrons on that nitrogen. It's like a carbocation, okay? Now, what I like to do normally, I wouldn't just have it leave. I could do that, that's perfectly valid. I normally go push it off, and I'll tell you why. So I take this pair of electrons, and they're just gonna go in here, and then I push that off. And the reason I do that is now, form my aluminium cation. I, the other structure I had there, the other structure I had there when I had the plus on the carbon, that's just a resonance structure. Draw either one of those. But now I have my aluminium cation. Does anybody remember the product of a primary amine with an aldehyde or ketone? All I have to do now is another proton transfer reaction, something something that pulls off protons comes along and pulls out that protein, that proton. And I got my final product. Now, in this reaction, the other product I would have, we didn't really take care of it, would be H2O. Okay, if I took a look at all my protons, we would see that H2O is our other product that came off here. So the tetrahedral intermediate, when we have a nucleophile adds to an aldehyde or a ketone, it can't undergo that elimination that the carboxylic acid derivatives do, so it has to do something else. In the case of this, we started off with an amine, R, uh, NH2, the amine had two protons. Notice now we've moved, we've taken off both of the protons from the nitrogen, and the oxygen is the carbon left as water. Oh, that's right, there's where our water came from. Right in that step of there, okay? So that water took the oxygen, came from the carbonyl compound, and the two protons on it, we can think of as coming from the amine. We lost NH2 from our amine, amine and oxygen 
from our uh, carbonyl compound. So that's what happens. The tetrahedral intermediate for aldehydes and ketones has to do something else because it can't undergo that elimination reaction. Okay. Now, uh, I'm not going to go through all the mechanism again, but let's look at what happens when we have a secondary amine, okay? And let's talk about that. And then, I, then I'm going to talk about some organometallics, some strong nucleophiles quickly, okay? So uh, what would happen if we had, I'm just going to use this, R and R, H, and my same, let's put the prime, no, let's be consistent. Okay, doesn't matter what R is, doesn't matter that that's CH3, this is a ketone. We have a nucleophile, let's put our pair of electrons there, okay? We have a nucleophile, we have an electrophile, Again, we probably would do this under acidic conditions, so I'm just going to put my acid there. Okay, I'm going to put it on there. Now we have our electrophile is activated. We do the same thing. We attack, and we throw the things up there. We get an amino alcohol. Uh, so we get a tetrahedral intermediate. That's followed by a proton. This is a, this is nucleophilic addition. Then we get a proton transfer. Our tetrahedral intermediate is positively charged. Then we get a neutral tetrahedral intermediate. And I'm going to draw that now. We have C. This is our amino alcohol. We went through the amino alcohol last time. What's the difference between this amino alcohol and the amino alcohol we made last time? And it's not up there, so I'm gonna tell you. The difference is, last time when we made our amino alcohol, we still had a proton there. Now we don't have a proton there. So we can't make an imine. We, we can't remove one of these R groups. Uh, we easily remove the proton, but we can't remove that, okay? Uh, we're still going to protonate this. We're still going to get rid of it, okay? Uh, that can still leave. We still lose the oxygen from the carbonyl compound. But now, I'm going to write this. The proton we're going to steal is over here, okay? Secondary amines don't have that second proton to be removed, so they cannot form imines. They can form the aminium cation, but they can't form it means themselves. So uh, what does happen here is another proton transfer reaction. To get a protonated tetrahedral intermediate. And I'm not putting the charge, I'm, you know, this is positive because there was a proton on it becomes neutral because we remove that proton, we put the proton back on its tetra. This is what it looks like. It is this thing. Okay, and now I am going to use this lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen. Whenever we see that, if this is new, it can leave us water. When you see that protonated oxygen with two protons on it, it can leave us water. So now we just have another elimination. An elimination is just the opposite of a nucleophilic addition. Um, where did I see CH2? Since you took away that protein. No, I didn't take it away. I just specifically drew the carbon-hydrogen bond. We didn't... Uh, didn't you proton transfer that to the water, though? No, no, no. I proton transferred something here. Uh, some base came along, took the proton off. 
that base now puts the proton on here. Okay, so this proton transfer reaction, uh, let's draw it up here. Was this, okay? That was the proton transfer that we did here, okay? The proton transfer from here, I'll draw the intermediate. It's getting messy. This is the tetrahedral intermediate that uh, something comes along and pulls this proton on to form this. See, that's just, that proton is now gone here. Something pulled it off. We have a long pair of electrons there. Okay. So this is something pulls this proton off. We form this. Something puts the proton up here. That whole thing is our, our proton shift. It doesn't just happen in one reaction. Something comes along pulls this proton off, forms this, that meanwhile floats up here and protonates this so that our proton just moved. Our proton moved from here to here, okay? So this is, I think, where people are getting lost. Take a look, I have a slide that talks about the proton shift in terms of it's not a simple one-step reaction, it's actually a couple steps. If you understand that, feel free to use proton shift, okay? Uh, but you need to understand that that's how it happens. So we're down here at the elimination step. And I am now going to eliminate, I could just, I could just pull this off, but I'm gonna push it off. And there's a reason I'm gonna push it off. I'm pushing it off with this pair of electrons. I'm gonna form a nitrogen, uh, nitrogen double bond. And then I'm gonna to have to erase everything and go back there, uh, but let's, So we're gonna have R, C, C, H, three, N, R prime, R prime, and a positive charge there. I could also put the positive charge here in carbon, nitrogen, single bond, that's resonance. That's the other concept, by the way, that you guys should just know, resonance. Okay, if you, if you don't understand resonance, you gotta figure that part out too. So this is our aluminium cation, we, we spit off water. I'm now gonna move everything down back here. And then I wanna get through because I wanna talk about the Grignard reaction in just a second. Okay. Uh, so we have our aluminium cation, we have R, C, N, I'm going to, this now I'm going to draw CH2 with a CH bond to it. This is what I was talking about. We have two R groups here. And we, we formed water, something, this is just a base, I'm going to use water as my base, I could use uh, one of the A means anything is going to come along. What's important here, though, is that we now have our aluminium cation. There's no proton on the nitrogen that we can remove, but there is a proton on the carbon that is beta to the aluminium carbon. So we just do an E2 elimination, like reaction here, kind of like an E2 elimination. This, again, is a it's a proton transfer, a pseudo proton transfer. If we, if this left, it would be an elimination reaction, but it doesn't quite leave. This just comes along, pulls off that proton. The electrons here form a carbon-carbon double bond, and these electrons just go up and neutralize that. If that were water in a single bond, this would be an E2 type of, it, it would be in the, E2 type of elimination reaction, okay? But uh, it's not water, it's the amine, it can't leave. So we get this thing, we get R, C, CH2, and 
R, R minus minus. This thing is both an E, all one word, E, that's the E, amy, that's the amy, an e -amy. Primary amines give us amines, I-M-I-N-E. Secondary amines give us enamines because it's not another proton to pull up to that nitrogen. So we have to get our proton somewhere else and it does it this way. The other product was water. Uh, and these are sensitive to water. We can do the reverse reactions. All these reactions are reversible. And we as the chemist, because we're all powerful, will control it. Okay, now I wanna talk, go ahead. Um, in the step where you take out the water, why can't you just do the, form the alkene in that step? What's the point of the extra step where you like, make the positive nitrogen? How many bonds can carbon? Oh. Like when you kick out the water, why can't you just put the hydrogen electrons in and make the alkene just in one step if you made it two steps? So you're, you're gonna kick off, you have this and you have the water. This one? Yeah. And then you have N. No, before it was a double bond. What was a double bond? The nitrogen. Well, no, it's, uh, oh, oh, I see, I see yeah. what you mean. From the, oh, I see, okay, from here. Actually, you know what, if, if you did that, I would accept that. Okay. So the, the answer is there's been mechanistic studies and they see that the water comes off. There's different experiments. So that's the way it actually happens. Okay. Mechanistically, what he's talking about, I would be fine with it because it makes mechanistic sense. So what he's talking about, we could also do this, our base, just pull this off here and this would be an elimination reaction the answer is that that, that proton transfer is a faster reaction uh, when we got to to get to there that proton transfer is a faster reaction and when the base comes along uh, it pulls that proton off because it's more acidic okay and then when we get we get stuck there right now, the most acidic proton is over here, okay? Having said that, that shows good chemical insight, uh, and I would not be upset if you did that. I'd probably give you a comment, probably goes through this. I would not take marks off if you did that because it makes chemical sense, okay? The only, you have to know a lot more to realize that uh, in this instance, that's, that's the most acidic hydrogen. Over here, uh, over here, that water just leaves uh, because that's a, that would be a very fast reaction for the water to just leave. This thing would exist for a very short time, kick the water off. Uh, this, e even though it's probably almost as acidic as over here, this reaction is just faster. Okay, but uh, that shows good chemical insight. It would be okay. That's and that's also something important. We do these mechanisms. That doesn't mean there's only one mechanism. There's very subtle other pathways that we could take. Our protons could go somewhere else, okay? So don't worry too much about that. One final thing I wanna talk about is strong nucleophile. And I wanna talk about, again, let's talk about a Grignard reagent. We can make Grignard reagents and you should, I'm gonna make this one. We just treat this with magnesium. We would do it in dry mercury, or dry solvent, probably in ether solvent, something that coordinates it well, and we get this compound. Now, we can think of this compound as being very much K 
cationic. It's not quite five cationic. This covalent bond is there, but it's very, very polar. That carbon is very nucleophilic, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna go through two different reactions and uh, I'm going to use one where I make it ionic and the other where I leave it, okay? Just to show the electron pushing and I'm gonna do two different reactions. So we have a strong nucleophile. The first one I'm gonna use it, I'm gonna pretend it's ionic, okay? And I am simply going to do this, R, okay? And I'm gonna say I have, uh, let's just make it this particular So in reality, the magnesium helps by coordinating with the oxygen. There's all sorts of stuff going on, but we simplify and what we say is here's our nucleophile. It's a strong nucleophile, strong enough. We can't have any acid around because that'll just quench this. This is done. This then forms my tetrahedral intermediate. My tetrahedral intermediate in this case And then our Mg, it just sits there until I get back from lunch and decide to throw a little bit of acid and water in there to prognate it, okay? This reaction happens pretty fast, but I can go and take a break. It sits there. I have to now work it up. So we'll call this reaction one. We now have to come in and reaction two is, we often use NH4. Cl, you can think of that as NH3 HCl. It's just a mild acid, but it's just this is a strong base. And really what we're doing is adding, we do this reaction, we add H plus, and we have lots of water around because we want to dissolve all of the magnesium salts that get formed from this. Okay? And all we do is protonate. alcohol from ketones what do aldehydes make they make an alcohol as well but they make a, a secondary alcohol okay except for the one aldehyde formaldehyde makes a primary alcohol so uh, these things these Grignard reagents react with carbonyl compounds to make alcohols, and we can make secondary and tertiary alcohols, okay? So now we have all that. Remember esters? Esters are, and remember acid chlorides, they're good electrophiles, they're very good electrophiles, the acid chlorides. The esters are decent enough electrophiles. Let's take a look at an ester and the reaction of an alkyl of a magnesium compound with an ester, okay? So now I have an ester and I'm gonna say R, C, O, and I'm gonna say O, R prime. I'm now gonna make my magnesium compound I, I made it, it's just R, there's a reason. Uh, I'm just putting R, I can do anything. And now, remember, this is very ionic, this is the nucleophilic portion. I like to start my electrons like this, because I'm trying to show that the electrons are remaining with this R group, that's why I kind of start that way. This is gonna lead um, the former tetrahedral intermediate. Remember I said before it just sits there and I could go away and come back? Now it doesn't just sit there, does it? What can this thing do? It now has something that can leave because it's an ester. 
pair of electrons reforms. Now, we can't kick off an R group, that's too strong a base, but we can kick off an alkoxide, even though it's a fairly strong base. And that's our product. We have OR prime minus MGBR plus as a salt. Okay, are we done? We think we're done. That's our product. Why am I not done? Okay. This is not a real good electrophile. It's a pretty good electrophile. We have a strong nucleophile. And after about a few minutes, we've made a bunch of this. This is a better electrophile. I'm sorry, when I, I, I meant electrophile. This is a better electrophile. We still have a bunch of this around, okay? So now, This is what I have. I had to make sure to use two equivalents of free marriage. Because that ketone's a better electrophile, and it just goes on. From esters, we end up adding two Grignards and getting a tertiary alcohol. Okay? So again, the reason happens to be when we had an aldehyde or a ketone and we added the Grignard, we formed a tetrahedral intermediate that had no option of eliminating anything. We went to lunch, we came back, we propanated it. Now, this thing can eliminate and it makes this. This is a good electrophile. It's gonna react with more of that very good nucleophile. And when I come back from lunch, I'm gonna have this. Now I just propanate it. I'm sorry, I used up four of your minutes. Uh, so I'll send an email out about the uh, tutorials, okay? Uh, this was a quick reminder of the difference and similarities, pattern recognition. So all of those carbonyl compounds undergo nucleophilic addition, but aldehydes and ketones can't undergo that elimination, so they have to take a different pathway, and that's gonna depend we have an amine, primary amine, secondary amine. If we have alcohols, we make those uh, acetals, right? Okay. If we have a diol that has that can form a five or six membered ring, our acetal likes to form that ring structure. Okay. So that's just a quick review. Thank you. Thank you.